Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We are very excited to welcome back Mark Yusko for a conversation on Bitcoin, crypto, and all things that are happening in the future. Good reminder uh, to everyone out there, if you guys have any questions, Mark is a fantastic expert and resource. Really recommend that you take advantage of that and put any questions you have in the chat or just a hello for Mark as well. I feel like, you know, it's been a long time. People might want to say hi again. Um, so you're welcome awesome. to throw a wave in there as well. Um, but yeah, so Mark, thanks so much for joining. Really, really appreciate it. Welcome back. How have you been in general? I think we left you last time in crypto winter, and now it feels like we're in spring, summer. Ah, uh, look, we are, we are, we are deeply into crypto summer. Although the mm -hmm. fun part starts in crypto fall, which will start this June post having. Mm -hmm. And uh, look, I always love the fact that you know the Alpha Nooner is uh, themed in orange, you know, Bitcoin mm -hmm. orange, which is good, and. Um, I'll do a quick little, you know, reveal since I always have the Bitcoin socks on, but this one I got to climb all the way up because I'm not at home. <laughs> but I do have the uh, uh, magic amazing. internet, money, uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, the magic, the internet, the Bitcoin wizard. So the join us, which is you know what yeah. I tweeted out with with the Alpha Nooner. So mm -hmm. uh, people need to join us on the show, but they also need to join us in owning. Bitcoin, you know, I've been talking about this forever, literally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole hashtag get off zero. Zero is the wrong number. And we're starting to see that permeate everywhere. So, you know, the early adopters, you know, the nerds, the geeks, the wizards, all that stuff, that, that happened kind mm -hmm. of from, you know, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, into 17, 18, 19. And that first decade is is tough for people to really kind of catch on. But now we have these ETFs, which make it possible to, to buy uh, without going through all the hassle of having a device and you know deal with the bare assets. And, and it's such a big deal. And I don't think people really appreciate how big. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. You go back a year, and a year is not that long, right? But a year ago, we were sitting just around 20K. We had rebounded 33% off the, you know, the the Hurricane Sam bottom of 15K, you know, back when, you know, everyone was like, oh, it's going to zero. Like, zero is a really big difference from $15,000 per coin. Now, it was zero in 2009. I mean, literally zero. There was no value in the network. It was a science experiment. People didn't really know what to think. You know, was this really anything? Today, if you spent any time with Bitcoin, you understand that it is the future of money. Right. And by money, I mean the base layer of money equivalent to to gold. Beyond that, you know, Michael Saylor has been on on TV lately talking about how it's digital property. Even calling it a cryptocurrency is undervaluing what this means. And there's this great book I've been been shilling for Chris Dixon called Read, Write, Own. And it talks about the evolution of the internet, right? Web one, offline, that was read, right? We could read web pages, we could kind of get information, but we couldn't really interact. You know, there, there was no real way to, to, to have it be two, to, two way. And then web two came along, social media and, and the like, and, and then it was read, write. And from that, we created, you know, now, trillions with a T dollars of value in these big media companies. But the problem was that they, the corporations own all the wealth, right? You know, we put pictures on Facebook. I mean, I don't, cause I don't even know how to use Facebook, but people put pictures on Facebook and they take their time and their content, right? They put it up and then Facebook, monetizes it by selling ads. Well, wait a minute. Why shouldn't the creator who puts up the content get paid? Well, in Web3, read, write, own, 
that's mm-hmm. what's going to happen. And and blockchain, blockchains plural, are the mechanism for doing this. And Bitcoin is simply the first application of blockchain, but its distinct application was to money and value and property. Because you and I, this is amazing, you and I can exchange something of value Mm -hmm. directly, peer to peer, no intermediary, no fees, no expenses, no charges. You know, if I want to send you money, right, fiat currency, you have to have a bank account. I have to have a bank account that charges fees for that. I send you a wire transfer. They charge me a fee for that. And eventually you, you get the money. It's time. Well, that system worked really, really well for hundreds of years, 838 years to be exact. And now we have a better system. And as more and more people realize that, we went from 20,000 a year ago to over 70,000 today per coin and a market cap well in excess of a trillion dollars. So again, from zero 15 years ago to over a trillion dollars. And here are two things for advisors that are really, really important. Actually, three things. One, it is, Bitcoin, the best performing asset of any asset that you have in your client portfolios. 12 of the last 15 years. And it's on pace to be, you know, 13 out of 16 because it's winning this year. Okay. So why do most people have zero? Doesn't make any sense. Second thing, the sharp ratio, meaning the return per unit of risk is the best over the past decade of any asset. And it's not close. So again, how could anyone have zero? Doesn't make any sense. And then the last is, and it really underpins that the second, the correlation of Bitcoin to bonds is 0.0. And the correlation to stocks is 0.15. So it's the best diversifying asset. If you look at the Markowitz framework for building portfolios, It's the best diversifying asset we've ever had. Better than hedge funds, better than private equity, better than real estate, better than REITs, better than commodities, better than CTAs, better than cannabis, better than anything. And that doesn't mean those other things aren't good. This is just better. So the light bulb's gone on that everybody has to get in the pool. But then we have a problem. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I do. I do want to talk about a little bit. You mentioned cannabis as well. And I think we've been going through kind of the same frustration where we see something that is, we see all the benefits of it. We see the opportunity. We see so much. And currently right now we're going through a bit of a time where nothing's really changed, but sentiment has turned a little bit and gotten a little bit choppier and hard. So I'd love to know just sort of your journey going through that, knowing all you know about Bitcoin, being so close to it, really understanding it and seeing the value in it. How did you kind of get through the crypto winner component? Like, you know, what was the sentiment like online? I'm sure there are a ton of people who, when things get choppy or rough, or they see in the short term, things are looking oh, not so great. For them. Look, what, what is that like? Look, I know. It's not. So look, I, I mean, I, look, I have white hair. I mean, that, that, that's you still have it. You didn't tear what it I've had to endure. Um, yeah. Look, my journey has been really interesting. And mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I joke, and it's not actually a joke. It's, it's real. Um, There's another great book called Bitcoin Billionaires by Ben Meserich, who also wrote, you know, uh, Dumb Money, which unbelievable. If you haven't seen the movie, you got to see it. I mean, it's just so good. So good. And Ben is such a great writer. But Bitcoin Billionaires is this great book about the Winklevoss twins. I was introduced to Bitcoin the same month, May of 2013, as the Winklevoss twins. They're multi-billionaires and I'm not. Now, part of the reason is they had $500 million from Facebook that I didn't. So you start with that much. You, it's easier to become a multi-billionaire. Um, okay, fine. But, but the real reason is they were in Ibiza with Charlie Shrem and they got it faster. I was in the traditional world where when I started talking to people about it, 
unlike in Ibiza where everybody said, oh, it's great, it's great, you'll love it. People were like, Mark, you're an idiot. What, what are you talking about? We'll, we'll fire you. Don't wear those stupid socks. Don't talk about Bitcoin. That's for drug dealers and terrorists. And it's like, wow. And so it took me a while. So into 14, you know, I wrote to clients and they're like, we'll fire you. Into 15, I told my son to go work in the industry. He's like, dad, come on. In now to his credit, he, he does acknowledge, although it's so funny. He says, you know, dad, yeah, you were right. Fine. But you didn't lever up and put the, you know, all the money in Bitcoin. I'm like, you little, yeah. Okay. You got you there. Because I was afraid, right? And yeah. and in 16, I finally got and so it took me a while. I mean, it took me a while. So in 17, right, we went from a couple thousand all the way to 20,000 in 18. So 20,000. And and I remember the day. It was December 18th and I remember they approved the futures. I'm like, oh, that's bad. That means now the big institutions come short this thing and we're going down. And I don't know how far down we were going to go, but we went down and we went down to 10 and then to six. And then at the, you know, at the end of 2018, November 2018, went all the way down to three. And people were like, oh, it's over. And I actually remember I was on TV. I was on CNBC on that day, December 6th, 2018. And, you know, the, the host says, uh, you know, well, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Isn't it going to zero? I'm like, no, it's not going to zero. And in fact, we just put out the, the Bitcoin, the Morgan Creek digital Bitcoin challenge. We said, we'll take the Buffett bet, million dollar bet for charity. We'll take Bitcoin and someone else take S and P for the next 10 years. Anyone who wants to do it. And we got crickets. No, actually that's not true. We got one guy who said he would do it. And his son said, dad, no, no way we're doing this. I mean, that's, that's, that's a bad bet. Cause if we win, we were supposed to win. If we lose, we look like idiots. No, we're not doing that. Sure. So no one would take the bet, which is a good thing. Cause Bitcoin's up way, way more than stocks. Like it's not close. But what's interesting is from that point of 3,200, we went all the way to $68,000 in November of 21. And then to your point, we went right back to crypto. Well, why do we keep having these cycles? Mm -hmm. This is the amazing thing, Mackenzie. Satoshi Nakamoto, who is maybe the most brilliant, and it's hard for me to believe it's one person, so it's probably a group of people because it's just so brilliant. And today, it's awesome. Today is Craig Wright Day. He was, you know, the judge declared that he is definitely not Satoshi. He definitely did not create Bitcoin. He, I mean, it was definitive. Like this guy lost in court. Yeah. So it's over. Will you but, confirm or deny also that you're not part of the group? You're not in the mix. You're not secretly going to do it. No, 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 no. I, look, I, I, I appreciate anyone even asking. It's, I mean, <laughs> I have been. I, look, I, I'm not a tech genius at all. And I, I believe that I may know some people who were part of the group. And we have, we have a venture partner. It's funny, Scott Stornetta. And if you read the white paper, Scott and his partner, Stuart Haber, who invented the word blockchain in 1991, they are listed three out of the eight papers that are cited by Satoshi. And people ask him all the time, so, well, if, if you were cited in the white paper, you must know who it is. And Scott's really funny. He, he starts speaking Japanese because he's he spent a lot of time in Japan. And he says in fluent Japanese, well, I might know who Satoshi is, given that I was around at that, that time. But if I did know, do you think I would actually tell you? And sure. since you don't understand what I'm saying, since I'm speaking Japanese, it's probably a moot point anyway. So I, I get a kick out of that. But look, there are a handful. And Hal Finney, right, who, uh, God rest his soul, he passed away from ALS perhaps, you know, is part of that group, but, but we'll, we'll never know. Cause I, my guess is they will stay uh, anonymous, but, but the bottom line is since that creation, mm -hmm. what they hard coded in was this process of something called the having. So in the beginning, every 10 minutes, they would create a block. And in order to create a block, you have to have miners, which are basically just computers, to cryptographically secure that data. 
create a hash. Okay. And in order to get someone, entice someone to buy computers and pay for electricity and do this, you pay them what's called a block reward. So the way Bitcoins were created is every 10 minutes, back in 2009, 50, 5 zero, Bitcoin were awarded to the miners. Every four years, that number gets cut in half. Well, if you think about that, the genius of it is if you cut the rewards in half, well, then some of the miners would go out of business. Well, the miners don't want to go out of business, so they hold their Bitcoin longer until the price rises because that's how markets work, right? Mm -hmm. People all say there's, you know, there's more buyers than sellers or more sellers than buyers. No, there's always the exact same number of buyers and sellers. That's how a transaction works. It's the price that adjusts. If a buyer wants to really buy, like right now, every day, money's going into the Bitcoin ETFs, those ETFs have to buy. They don't have a choice. They must buy. So they are price insensitive. No matter what the price, they've got to buy it. The sellers, on the other hand, are like, hmm, I don't have to sell. So you know what? Unless you pay me more, I'm not going to sell. Now, if they need the money really fast, like say the electricity bill comes due, they're like, I just got to sell no matter what the price, no matter if the price is falling or whatever. It doesn't really matter. So supply and demand have to balance. But if so, if the price then starts to rise, well, what happens? Well, that causes attention and that causes activity. And so we get these cycles where the price starts to go up. And the problem with the price going up of anything, whether it's NVIDIA shares or MicroStrategy or Bitcoin, the gamblers start to come in. They're like, oh, look how high this is going. I'm just going to buy it. You know, Did you do any work? Well, no, it's just going up. I'm going to buy it. And so it pushes the price to crazy town. So that was 2017 at 20,000. The fair value of the network was 10,000. We got to 20,000. In 21, the fair value of the network was 31,000 and we got to 68. Well, eventually the kid says, hey, that guy's not wearing any clothes, right? The emperor has no clothes and the price will adjust. And that's crypto winter. So we went through crypto winter in 21 and we went all the way down right? All the way down to 15,000, way below the fair value because the fair value had started to creep up into the 40s. So we were way below fair value. Well, then what happens? Well, when any asset, again, whether it's a cannabis stock or, you know, a bond, it doesn't matter if, if the price is below the fair value, because that's one of the things about price. Price does not equal value. In fact, John Burbank, one of my good buddies in the hedge fund, said price is a liar. Right? Price has nothing to do with value. Price is just what two people agree to exchange a small amount of good or service. Mm -hmm. The value is what the value of the asset is. And I always use a simple example. Let's say Microsoft stock. If I had 100 shares of Microsoft and I want to sell to you, we can see the price on the NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. Right, That's the price for 100 shares. The problem is if I'm Bill Gates, which I'm not, but if, if I were and I had a million shares and I wanted to sell, you don't get that price. Yep. You're going to actually get a lower price because in order to sell a million shares, you've got to incent people to buy and people know you got to sell a lot of shares. So they're going to offer you a lower price. So that's how markets actually work. So as those investors, people like me, I, I consider myself a value investor. I like to buy things below fair value. Mm -hmm. So when the price was 15, and the fair value is in the 40s, I'm waving it in. Like, Come on in, yeah. So I'm gonna buy it, so that was a year mm -hmm. ago. And for the last year, we've been in, we went from crypto winter in 21 into crypto spring, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where the price kind of stabilizes, then crypto summer, which we're in today, right? So from June of 23 to June of 24 is crypto summer, and crypto summer is where you start to get back to fair value. So fair value today is in the low 50s. Well, we got there right before the ETF launch. And now we've exploded up to 70. It's like, what's going on? Supply and demand. Mm -hmm. You've got a shock to the system, right? A demand shock. So if you think about supply and demand, it looks like this. 
So I can increase my demand, right? I can shift the aggregate demand curve out and the price goes up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, just that, math, that's how it works, logic. yeah. Well, then what's gonna happen is then we're gonna cut the aggregate supply. supply. The halving is gonna happen. Instead of 900 a day, we're gonna have 450 a day and the ETFs are buying eight to 10,000 a day. So let's mm -hmm. just do that math. If there's only 900 new and they have to buy 10,000, that means they have to find someone to sell. Well, there's a whole bunch of people, they call them hodlers or holders. They don't want to sell. They're like, I'm not going to sell at any price. There's a price. I always tell the story of, I live in Chapel Hill here in North Carolina. And when I first moved here, I worked at the university and you know, there's a street runs through the middle of town, divides the university and the town called Franklin Street. And there are these old houses from the 1700s that are all very quaint and, and very nice and, and very desirable because you're right next to campus. And back then, these houses were selling, you know, three, four hundred grand. And this guy was out clipping his hedges one day and this famous billionaire grad came and said, I, I, I want your house. And, uh, you know, for football weekends and basketball weekends. And... Uh, the guy said, well, my house isn't for sale. What are you talking about? He says, Sir. everything's for sale. Name a price. The guy said, no, it's not for sale. He mm -hmm. says, come on, name a price. He says, okay, fine. A million dollars. He said, yep, here you go. Here's a check. And he's like, I didn't want to sell. Hey, you said a million. Here's the million. You got to sell it. And he ended up having to sell. Now that house today, which is ridiculous because it's a little tiny house, sells for like $3 million. But because the he money should have asked for it in Bitcoin. I feel like he would have, you know, really made out eventually a longer term. But oh, yeah, no, it would have been much better in Bitcoin. But although that was 20 plus years ago, Bitcoin didn't exist. But anyway, okay. so the point is supply and demand drive price. Mm -hmm. And the nice, so that to answer your question, how do you survive the downdraft? Mm -hmm. You just got to keep focused on the long term and understand that every asset goes through these cyclical emotions. Mm -hmm. And remember, I mean, again, I mean, you're, you're young, I'm old. So Amazon is a great example. Amazon launched 1997, or, or I mean, what public, 1997, 98. And um, stock went roaring up into 2000. And then we had the tech wreck. The stock went down 94%. Think about that. 94% cover, you know, Amazon.bomb and all this stuff. And was that a good time to sell? Heck to the no. That was when you should have been buying with both hands, but no one did, right? Because they thought it was over. And here's the crazy thing about Amazon. Amazon's been a public company for 28 years. 28 years. In every single year, every single one, it's at a double digit drawdown on average, 31%. So on average, you lose 30% of your money every year. When was the right time to sell? Never. But how many people bought on day one and held to today? I say there's five. Jeff, mom, dad, ex-wife, and Bill Miller, whose cost is like seven cents. So the reality is Bitcoin's the same thing. Bitcoin has the same volatility as Amazon. They both have 80 volatility. And it's an asset that if you look at it every day, you're going you're gonna to do dumb things, right? You're going to act on those emotions when the price moves, but the value just keeps accreting higher. Why? Because the network keeps growing. The number of nodes in the Bitcoin blockchain, right? The little B Bitcoin, because there's two Bitcoins. There's the network the little b Bitcoin, which is all the nodes connected around the world that are now acting as this new computing platform, right? Back to the book, you, everyone should read Chris Dixon's book, Read, Write, Own. So this is the ownership, Web3, the network. It's all about the network and these computing platforms. Well, then there's the big B Bitcoin, which is the token. And remember, a token isn't a little thing. It's not like a little disk of gold or a little coin. It's literally an entry in a ledger mm -hmm. and ledger, okay, it's just a, a record. But the difference is in the old days, we would keep ledgers on pieces of paper, like papyrus, and, 
stone tablets or piece of, and then we computerized them and we made dual entry accounting. But the problem with dual entry accounting in the, and the system that we've had for the last 838 years is it all relies on trust, right? I actually have this, this recurring nightmare, like not all the time, but you know, a couple times a year probably, where I go to the ATM and I punch in my code and it says zero. Like, whoa, how would I prove it's not zero? It's their word against mine. I don't have a physical statement. I haven't had statements in 10 years. And I trust them that they, and look, 99.99% of the time, those banks, those brokerage firms, those accountants, they're trustworthy. Mm -hmm. The problem is that 0.1%, it's really bad for the person who, you know, loses the trust. So in this triple entry accounting world, in the world of blockchains, where blockchains become the computers and we can store value, we don't have to trust because we have truth. truth and for trust. Yeah. that's what we're really doing here is we're swapping this trust world for truth. And truth comes from this technological innovation called blockchains. And Bitcoin is just one application of blockchains. There will be many other applications of blockchains, things like title insurance for your house and your car. And your, you know, we won't carry around a driver's license. It'll be on the blockchain. And the policeman will go to their car and they'll look at it and they can say, yeah, that's yours. And so all of this is, is going to eventually happen. It just takes time. But that's true of any technological innovation. And that's why you know the earliest investors in any technology have to endure this. But yeah. what happens is that volatility starts to Turns get up. lower mm -hmm. and eventually we'll have a mature market and it'll act more like a stable coin, you know, kind of like, well, <laughs> the way, the way companies like IBM used to before, you know, the whole world started trading like penny stocks, but, yeah. um, you know, that's more the that's more the the leverage inherent in the system. Yeah. So I think again, that's a great way to explain it. The one thing that I would um, touch on is for other. So I think Bitcoin has a lot of trust in general. Um, people know it. It has sort of the biggest name in the space in general. Yep. I know Ethereum's still there. You mentioned some of the meme coins are still kind of cycling through. Um, what's your take on sort of the the other players in the space? Is it sort of noise? Yeah. Does it so look okay. Bitcoin is money right? Bitcoin is digital gold, digital property. Ethereum, Solana, Polkadot, Cosmos, those are different. They are computing platforms, right? They're blockchains. Ethereum is kind of like www. right? It's kind of like the platform on which other developers build things, what are called L2s and L3s that allow you to do things faster and better and, and, and ultimately cheaper. And you know, a great example would be, or a great analogy would be, think about how you, how you and I spend money. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't carry money. I don't carry green pieces of paper anymore. I have a little plastic card. I give it to the person. And once a month, not every day, once a month, I settle down to the main chain that is ACH, right? I make an ACH from my bank to Visa that then the bank settles on the ultimate Fed wire, the ultimate record, the ledger of, of money. And that's the same thing with these strategies is people say, oh, Bitcoin's so slow and you know it can't process enough transactions. Fine, we'll have Ethereum to process transactions or Solana to process transactions. If I wanna send you USDC, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to pay a lot for that. So I could use maybe the Solana blockchain and, and use the phantom wallet. Or, you know, maybe if I want to do a, a cross border transfer, I may not want to, you know, pay the high gas fees for, for Ethereum. So I may want to use a, a layer two like base uh, that Coinbase has come up with. So the, the idea of technology is you can either be fast or secure. Take your pick. You can't be both, right? So if you want to be really, really secure, you can't be really fast. 
if you want to be really fast, you're going to be less secure. So Solana is okay. super fast, but occasionally the system breaks down because its clock moves too fast. Bitcoin is not fast at all. Never claimed to be. It's just super secure. It's never yeah. been hacked. Not once. I was say, and it's only yeah. had like 22 minutes of downtime in 15 years. So it's super secure. And so if we think about the other things, you know, we, people say, well, if you don't like Bitcoin only, then you're a shit coiner, you know, technical term. Like, well, <laughs> that's kind of silly because blockchains and computing, the evolution of computing, it's not all going to be on Bitcoin, right? There is a world that you could imagine where we develop L2s and L3s that sit on top of Bitcoin and everything settles to the Bitcoin blockchain. Hasn't happened yet. It's possible and people are working on it. But in the short run, we have these other systems, Ethereum, Solana, you know, Cosmos, Polkadot, even Monero and Dash and other things. But, but those have a role. They are, think of them as world computers, mm -hmm. different than digital property, which is what Bitcoin. Bitcoin's won that race. None of these others are ever going to be money, the way we think about money. Bitcoin is money. But a world computer that can replace how you know we all have a laptop and we all have our mobile phones that are computing, having a blockchain world computer is a better system. All right? So those were meme coins. Look, that's so just... No, 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 no. But... What oh. they are, they're monetizing attention. Yes. Right? That's all they are. Yeah. It's basically saying, hey, look, we're all part of this club and we're going we're gonna to kick in some money to create this thing and then we're going to trade it amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. But let's take this to the logical extreme. When everyone says, you know what? I actually need to spend some of that money then they have to sell. Well, if you know someone's eventually going to sell, then you better sell before they do. And yeah. so you have this gain theory problem. And so in a momentum market like we're in now, number go up. Mm -hmm. And you can create a meme coin and you can spread the, 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 the network effect and it'll go up. You know, Pepe, Bobo, whatever. Okay, great. Yeah. But here's the problem. Someone... So let's take Doge, for example. Someone, and we actually know who those someones are, Elon Musk and Mark Cuban, own a big old chunk of the overall percentage. If those two actually start selling, that price will go down in a nanosecond, like in a mm -hmm. nanosecond. And then everybody will pile out and the mm -hmm. last one standing will lose everything. So it's not that you can't make money in a meme coin, you can. Mm -hmm. And you could even have a situation where Doge is simply a, a, a fork of Litecoin, right? I think that's right. And so it, it could have, and Litecoin is just a, a fork of, of Bitcoin. So it could have some use case so like there was a guy I know, he tried to buy a, a, a parlor. So there's a super right wing kind of competitor to Twitter yeah. called Parlor. Mm -hmm. And he was going to try to make Doge what you used to tip everybody inside Parlor. Mm -hmm. like, well, then there would be a use case and maybe it could have some value. Right now it doesn't have any value. It's just, it's, it's literally like a Chuck E. Cheese token. And you decide you want to play that Atari game more than I do. So you're willing to pay me more than the 25 cents I paid for the Chuck E. Cheese token because you really want to play the game. So you'll give me 50 cents. So I'll give it to you so you can play the game. But then you say, well, I don't really want to play the game. I want to find someone who wants to play the game even more. So they have to pay me 75 cents. Well, that's fine. But it still only costs 25 if I go buy it over Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. So. Anyway, that's a long way to wait, wait. And it doesn't, it's not that these things are inherently evil. Mm -hmm. And it's just that for something to have actual value, 
in anything, there has to be a use case, right? There are plenty of penny stocks that have been created. I remember getting a call this amazing. In Remember the, the craze when, when EVs were just starting to get hot and everybody was talking about cobalt yep. and we weren't you know, showing the Mine. pictures of the little kids mining it, but everyone was talking about cobalt. And that was about the time that all the companies were changing their name to blockchain, right? You know, like you had Long Island Ice Tea changed to Long Island Blockchain. Yep. Well, these guys called me up and they said, hey, we're doing this new company called Cobalt Blockchain. I'm like, oh, okay, tell me more. Well, we think that using blockchain to, uh, auth or to um, authenticate the origin of the cobalt so it's not from a conflict zone hmm. is a good thing. I'm like, okay, it's actually a good use case. All right, I like mm -hmm. that. How much cobalt do you have? Oh, well, we don't have any. I said, well, where are you going to get it? Oh, well, we did a reverse merger on this gold mining company, and they have some leases in Democratic Republic of Congo, and we hear there's cobalt there. I'm like, so you basically just did a search for the two hottest search terms, cobalt and blockchain. You name the company, and you're trying to scam people, which is exactly what happened. They raised $6 million, none of it mine. They you know, did this reverse merger, and it went to zero because they had no cobalt. And- but that's the thing that yeah. that's been going on. That's why you had boiler rooms, the Wolf of Wall Street. That's as old as time. That's not mm -hmm. just meme coins. So I have no problem if people want to speculate and gamble. Go for it. People go to Vegas. I don't understand it. I mean, but understanding the risks, I think, is the important thing ultimately. And I think what you're understand the risks, on, right? Yeah, understanding and, the risks is the important. Difference, the difference between Bitcoin, which is the gold standard and is mm -hmm. digital gold and digital property, which is had nothing to do with a meme coin like Pepe. If you like pictures of ugly frogs, knock yourself out. And if sure. you want to trade stuff with people, knock yourself out. But don't conflate the two, right? Digital assets and meme coins have nothing in common except that they are tokens on a blockchain. That's it. Yeah, no, no, totally agree. I, I think you did tap into something a little bit earlier, though, that I thought was super interesting. Sort of that component where, you know, the tech looks different and sort of the scheme looks different with the cobalt, but ultimately it's that same thing. Humans oftentimes will try to take gamble, will try to. Scheme oh, Mackenzie, humans are going to human. They're humans all the time throughout, yeah. are going to human. And it's true. And, and anytime there's money involved, of and course. what is money? Again, money is anything that people Freedom. use to transact instead of barter. So mm -hmm. in the olden days, there, you know, there were puka shells or stone tablets or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, copper coins, right? The, the original Moneta coin from uh, the, the Venetians. Um, no, not the Venetians, the, um, the nice Templar, right? They started with, with copper coins and then they uh, went to, to gold um, in the Roman empire. So, all of this stuff is tied to the fact that that humans are going to human and we we have greed and we have fear and the cycles repeat over and over and and we don't seem to learn from history we're just doomed to repeat it mm -hmm. and but at the end of the day we do change we do evolve meaning technology evolves and the fact that you and I are talking live in three, I mean, in, in high definition, which I, I like the old days of being a little fuzzier. Um, <laughs> but although I did, wa I watched a 1993 Chicago Bulls versus Orlando Magic game the other day on one uh -huh. of the, the TV channels. I'm like, we actually watched this? I, I couldn't even make out people's face. It was so blurry. But even blurry, yeah. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. All deference Here to LeBron. Holy yeah. moly. I mean, he scored 24, 28 points in the first quarter in this game. And there were people like hanging on him. And he was still swish, Doing swish, it. swish. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Again, yeah, blurry or not, I think that's a, it speaks also to the human element. We're able to kind of fill in the gaps, make it look like a person, and it, it fully works. But yeah. yeah, technology has come incredibly far, um, which is fantastic. But again, I think the human element ties into 
why having someone like you that can also look back into history and say, hey guys, you know, talking to clients, it's a little bit crazy now, but maybe it's not. They're probably hopefully sending you thank you cards now after you talked them off some ledges, who knows? Um, well, but, yeah. you know, it's funny. I, I, yes, we, we, we do get, we do get pats on the back and, and sure. what I really love, I, I love when people on Twitter, um, say, Hey, you know, you changed my life. I'm like, no, I didn't. You changed your life. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you told me to buy. I'm like, I told lots of people to buy Bitcoin in 2017 and 2018. I was on television. You know, mm -hmm. there was one day I was on. And it went from eight to six while I was, no, I'm sorry, 10 to eight. It went from 10 to eight while I was on the show. I was only on the show for six minutes, right? And Melissa Lee says, you know, what should we do? I'm like, buy it. She says, oh, well, you'd always say that. I'm like, well, yeah, I would. Buy it today, buy it tomorrow, buy it next week, buy it next month. Don't buy it all at once, but, but buy it and just accumulate ownership in this network. And so in theory, I... You know, I said that, but I didn't act. Lots and lots of people hear good ideas. Mm -hmm. But if you, anyone, acts, you are changing your life. So I appreciate the shout out, but it ain't me. I mean, I I like to educate. I like to talk. <laughs> Obviously, I like to talk. Um, but But the key is, ultimately, it's the actions, not the words. And so... The, the, the only negative right now is I hear people saying, oh, we missed it. Like, are you joking? <laughs> Maybe the national anthem has ended. Maybe we're in the first inning, but the game's barely started. I mean, we are at just the knee of the curve. So if you think about an S curve, you get 10 years for the early adopters, 10 years for the, the, the middle 80%, and then 10 years for maturity. We're just entering that second decade. First four years, science experiment doesn't really count. The next 10 years, real. This year, real. But we're not even a year into the upward slope of the S-curve. And so to say you missed it, not even close, right? So yeah. that's, that's the one thing where no matter, no matter how closer relationship you have with people, no matter how many times you interact with people, there are always going to be people that if you tell them something and it doesn't play out exactly the way you said, like, oh, you were wrong. Like, no, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, I was wrong then, but facts change. I changed my mind and now I got a new opinion. And that's yeah. the, one, what the, only, the only thing I hate about Twitter is people will go back four years and say, you said this. Like, I've changed my mind like 17 times in four years. Come on. So, Which you should. New information comes in. You want to make you, sure you have absolutely. the right thesis. All that stuff is important. Lord yeah. Keynes, right? One of my favorites. He gave a speech. Two weeks later, gave a similar speech. Made a couple of changes. And there's a guy in the front row who said, I was at your speech two weeks ago. And two weeks ago, you said the exact opposite. He says, well, sir, when the facts change, I changed my mind. What What do you do? Yeah, and, it's true. and it's really funny because I, I tell the story that you know my wife's only seen me speak one time. She came to Vegas and she watched me talk, and at the end, she says, Mark, you, you can't say things like that. I'm like, no, what I say? She says, no, 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 not what you said. It's like how you say them. I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, you say things so forcefully. I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? She says, well, people will believe you. I'm like, well, that's kind of the idea, actually. She says, but what if you're wrong? I said, I'm wrong all the time. I just, I just changed my mind. I mean, so strong opinions, loosely held, because a couple things. One, if you don't do the work, you'll never get a strong opinion. If you don't have a strong opinion, you won't have the courage to act. Now, if you don't loosely hold them, you won't be willing to change your mind if inf new information comes in. Mm -hmm. And the superpower of investing is the ability to change your mind when new information comes in. It's pretty yeah. simple. That true. That makes sense. Okay, great story. I think as we're wrapping up, I just wanted to mention. So I feel like you've dropped a few really good reads that you've done lately. Yep. Are you going to write a book between like Bitcoin? I think all the stuff you guys are doing at Morgan Creek Digital in general. I, with well, I appreciate AI, I appreciate everything. that. I I've been asked multiple times. I always say, well, in 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 what time am I going to do that? I had a buddy, That's Mark Anson, used to run Calpers. Um, 
And he wrote this big book and it. I mean, it's like this big and it's on everybody's shelf because it's in the CFA. And I'm like, you're the, you know, you're the CIO of CalPERS, one of the biggest pension funds. You got a family. How did you write this book? He said, well, I'd get up every morning around, you know, uh, four o'clock and I'd write from four to six. I'm like, nope, I'm that has not happened. I am not a morning person. So I would say, when am I going to do it? And I used to write these super long letters, like 40, 60, 80 pages every quarter. And probably what I should do is just take those and give them to somebody and say, hey, turn this into a book. But Give it to AI. I, you know, would you do something like that? You could just feed it all into something where it all processes it through. Uh, you know what? Know. Actually, that's a really good idea. I might try. I actually might try that. Um, go. But I, I'm really good at synthesizing other people's information. That's kind of been my, my thing. I don't know that I'm so great at creating original thought, which that's hard. That's really hard. But I, you know, there's, there's, there's room for both in the world. And, um, the one thing I have thought, I mean, I I haven't done it, but I, I probably should. I've been tweeting this thing and it drives some people crazy. Um, my hashtag edge. Just, so just about every day I will say, you know, such and such equals edge. Like this morning it was frightened equals edge. Because Paul Tudor Jones says, if you're not afraid, if you're overconfident and you think you know everything, then you're going to get, you're going to get wrecked. Mm -hmm. So, and whether it's, you know, having courage is edge or doing your homework is edge. Well, I, but I'm, so I've been doing that. And someone, someone did a word cloud of that for me. So they did, they fed all my tweets in and they gave me this word cloud. I'm like, there's a book there, right? You call it edge and you say, here are the things that make up edge. And um, that's probably the closest I would come to doing something. I would say, promise me when you do your media tour for your release that we're on that list and you get to talk about it on the show. That would be great. Right. Also awesome. good reminder for anybody who's not following Mark again, would recommend at Mark Yusko on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. A uh, lot of insight there. And again, you post the fun socks there, which I think is also super fun and great in the mix as well. Um, all right. Well, Mark, Just thanks for One other thing. It's brand yes, new. Uh, we have a new podcast and a new YouTube channel. So mm -hmm. I've been on lots of podcasts and, and I love mm -hmm. doing them, but I finally decided it was time to build our own brand. So Morgan Creek Digital mm -hmm. has something called Digital Currents. So if you go to at Digital Currents, you'll, you'll find us. And we have Spotify, we have Apple, but we also have YouTube, which has video. Uh, so, uh, digital currents, uh, YouTube channel. And, uh, we're really excited about that. We do a weekly show, uh, as well as some one-off shows and, um, that's cool. Yeah, definitely recommend. I see a lot of people on YouTube too. So I would say head on over there, hit the subscribe, hit the bell. Cause I feel like you'll see it when everything drops and that'll be fantastic. Mark, again, thanks for taking the time. Everyone. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Awesome. We'll catch you next time. Thanks so much. For investing, carefully consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses found in the prospectus, available at advisorshares.com.